All right, now I'm going to present our speaker for tonight. Um, a little history on our speaker. She is a graduate from Chestnut Hill College, 2003 class, uh, with a, chemi a major in chemistry and environmental science. After uh, being at Chestnut Hill College, she went to the, uh, North, the, the College of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, where she got a PhD in analytical chemistry and eventually came back here to teach uh, chemistry. Uh, I met Dr. Wendling my freshman year, and the, um, the moment that I met her, that uh, the professor and uh, student bond was there. I go to Dr. Wendling nowadays if I have any questions about my professional or if I just have questions about my personal life, because I know that Dr. Wendling will always be there. Um, so it gives me great honor that I'm able to introduce our speaker for our third annual Agape Latte, Dr. Karen Wendling. So I asked for the lapel mic because I wanted my hands to be free to be able to move around a little bit. Um, so thank you so much for everybody for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, it really is a privilege. And I'm also going to ask for, um, I don't know, for your patience, your understanding. Um, this is harder for me to talk about in terms of my personal history, uh, much harder than it would be for me to teach you some chemistry. Uh, <laughs> so please bear with me. Um, I have a couple of stories to share with you tonight um, that I'm hoping will, will speak to you and inspire you in, in one way or another. And the first story actually um, takes me back to um, when I was in high school. I had the privilege of, an, of attending um, a very good high school, a high school that had very caring teachers. Um, but it was a high school that was really um, dedicated, really grounded in a conservative, Protestant, Presbyterian um, religion basically. And so I was having excellent science classes with wonderful teachers that, who were teaching me about logic and critical thinking and how everything in the world, like it really should make sense. And then I moved into Bible class where there were things that made a lot of sense to me. Um, things that seemed so basic, like God is good. Like, yes, that, that makes sense. And then there were a few things that they started to tell me that didn't make sense. Um, they told me that while women and men are equal, that women have different roles to play in our world, because God just made us to be different and to do different things. Uh, they also told me that uh, there's a whole group of people that God has pre-selected, predestined, and that those people are going to go to heaven. And, you know, well, we hope you're in that group, but if you're not in that group, you're going to go to hell. Well, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Uh, if God is good, then God wouldn't do that, right? God wouldn't send a group of people, and I even like really pushed back on this with my teacher. I said like, like I'm gonna play hardball with you. It's like, what about the babies who die, you know? And literally this man looked at me and he said, oh, well, half of them go to heaven and half of them go to hell. And um, this threw me into a real crisis. Um, I was crying, I was very upset. Fortunately, my parents didn't see it that way, and thank goodness I went to my pastor and I was crying, and I was like, if God is really saying this, then I can't believe in that God. And he's like, okay, I don't, I don't think God is saying that. But the point is, and the why I'm telling you this story, is that I realized that I couldn't be a different person. I couldn't use my brain differently in chemistry class and in Bible class. Right? I couldn't abandon the logic that I was learning in science when I walked into church. I couldn't be a different person on a Monday than a Sunday. <laughs> so somehow I had to find a way of making sense of this. And I made sense of it by saying that God is good and I don't think a good God is gonna send all those people to hell. The other problem was a little more insidious. Right, I got to the end of high school and I was, yeah, science, I love biology, I love chemistry, this is great, I want to go to 
college. I'm even thinking about going to med school. Uh, this is gonna be great. And then I had all these people being like, nah, you don't really wanna do that. Nah, nah, what's, what's, wh and one person even said, why would you wanna do that? And then I realized um, it was because I was a woman that they were telling me these things. And now, that just didn't make sense either. I mean, I was listening to these wonderful musical presentations beforehand, and I'm like, I'm sorry, but God wouldn't give you a voice like that and then ask you not to sing, right? God wouldn't give me an interest for science, a passion for it, a dedication for it, a willing to stay up late and do those problems over and over again, right? If I wasn't supposed to do that, right? you know, there's a bigger God than this. There's a more inclusive God than this. And I'm going to worship that God, right? So I said, all right, goodbye. I'll take my diploma, you know. Thank you, science teachers. Everything was great. And I came here to Chestnut Hill College, an all women's college at the time. And I was like blown away because almost all of my, um, my teachers were women. Like all of my chemistry professors um, were, were women. Um, and no more was I being told you can't do this career because you're a woman. Um, and not only that, but I still remember sitting down with my advisor, Bob Meyer. Anyone? Bob Meyer? Yeah? Wonderful. And I was like, I'm thinking about being a teacher eventually. And I was just waiting. I was waiting for like the, nah, you can't do that. And he was like, sounds great, go for it. What? Really? Okay, I can do this. So then I sat down in my chemistry class and I loved it. I actually started out as an environmental science major and chemistry was just an also required class. And I loved my chemistry class. I loved it not because it was easy. I loved it because it was hard. <laughs> I loved it because it challenged me and it said, all right, are you really w willing to work to understand this? And if you are, it will make sense. I mean, all of us scientists in the room, you know that point where you're like, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't make sense. And then you're like, oh, it does make sense. And that was the moment that I lived for. And that was the point when I decided that I wanted to be a college professor. I wanted to be a college professor at a school like Chestnut Hill College, a school where I could mentor students the way that the Chestnut Hill College professors were mentoring me. Also, I have to say it was really wonderful to be amongst the Sisters of St. Joseph, who are even known to refer to God as she. It was wonderful. Very, very refreshing. Yep. So fast forward, right? moving into my second story now. Um, applying to grad school, because you can do the math. If there's a certain career that you want, you can kind of backtrack and like you can see all the hoops that you have to jump through. And it's like if I want to teach somewhere like Chestnut Hill College, then I got to step back and I got to have a PhD in chemistry. Okay, well in order to do that, you have to go to grad school. In order to do that, you have to do undergraduate research. So that was the path. So I applied to grad schools. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew it was something with chemistry and I didn't know what. And there's like five different specializations in chemistry. And I kept just switching. Like, oh, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. So I was like, all right. I applied to a bunch of schools. I sort of just picked one of those five. I got in. And when, they, when you get in, they usually say, well, come and visit, meet everybody, and see if you want to come here for grad school. So I did that. Went around to different places, which is actually very difficult in my senior year, because it's very hard to just leave for a few days and miss your classes. Very difficult. Right. And so I visited at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Right. And the town was great. Faculty seemed really great. There were two or three faculty I could really see myself working with, doing research. I thought, you know what? I think this is the place for me. Said yes. Went down there with my mom. We found me an apartment. I got two kittens. <laughs> Seriously, named them Mole and Schrodinger. <laughs> see, only the scientists are laughing. <laughs> Right, Mole, Mole and Schrodinger. And you would think that this is the, uh, maybe the end of a happy story. <sighs> Nightmare scenario. Show up, first day of class, talking to everybody. And they're like, you know this is the number one program in the world for analytical chemistry, right? No, I didn't know that. Right? Doesn't that mean it's going to be really hard? 
yes, yes, it does mean that, right? Um, I found out that the three research advisors that I was interested in, one of them was leaving, one of them had a problem with women, which meant I had one shot. One out of three was left to me. And that advisor would have to accept me into his lab, right? It wasn't just me picking him, he had to also pick me, right? So I'm like, oh yeah, this is easy. I'm gonna have three classes. I'm used to taking like five or six at Chestnut Hill. Insanely difficult classes. Um, oh, and, and every once a month, you're supposed to show up on a Saturday morning. It really hurt. Um, and you're supposed to take a test uh, that all you know about it is the topic. Like, no information other than that. And you have to pass a certain number of these if you wanna stay in the program, right? And you're trying to get the, pro the professors to like let you into their lab. Right? So I was like, all right, I got this. I can do this. Got ready for my first test. Epically, epically failed. First time in my life. I think it was like a 46. Epic. And my next thought was, oh, I bet everybody got, like maybe the average was a 50. The average was an 86. And the professor got up in front of everybody and said, I don't really worry about any of you except the student who got the 46. Oh my gosh, All right? Everything I had done to prepare me for that test, everything that had worked for every other test I'd taken in my life totally did not work for this class. It just didn't work, right? I literally called home, like practically in tears, and I said, Mom, does God make mistakes? Because it really felt like this was a giant mistake. And then I sat back and said, all right, all right. Put, put your science hat on here. Put your critical thinking hat on here. What are your options? What are your choices? My options were stay and keep doing what I'm doing, which means I'm going to fail. Leave. Always an option. Leave, leave and go somewhere else probably, yeah. Or three, s stay. Stay and try. Stay and do something different. Now, I was already trying, but could I stay and give it my best, give it even more, right? Work harder, work longer, work smarter, still knowing that I could fail. And what I decided was I would rather live with the knowledge that I wasn't good enough for this, live with the knowledge that I failed, rather than live with the uncertainty of leaving or the uncertainty of staying and not trying. Right, so I was already working hard, working late. Right? I already was getting a few hours of sleep a night. I was a mess. I was losing weight. Uh, it, it was not pretty. And I said, you know what? I have to do the experiment here. I have to try this and give it everything and get smart about it for me to know if I can actually do it or not. And so if students out there, if you want to talk about like smarter, come talk to me later. But I talked to the students who'd passed the class. I said, what did you do? I found copies of the old exams. I made friends with friends who knew this stuff and it came easy to them. And I worked my tail off. Insane. I, I, can't, I almost have repressed it because it was really insane. Right. So the next test, which is in a different class, did very well. And that was the class where the professor of that class was the professor that I wanted to go into his research group. And so he said, yeah, you can come into my research group. You know, you got the second highest score on my, on my test. All right, okay, I can, I can do this. And somehow or another, with all that work, I managed to get through the other classes. Not only that, I actually managed to do well in a couple of them. Right. But I was a mess really mess. I came home at Christmas. I was sleeping poorly. I'd lost weight. I was so stressed out. And it was one of the hardest things in my life to go back down there, driving with my two little cats <laughs> back down to North Carolina, knowing what was in store for me. And I said, you know what? This isn't going to work. Like, I, I will physically die <laughs> before I get this degree. Something has to change. I said, all right. Can I pull back a little bit? Can I do the experiment? Can I sleep a little more? Can I get more strategic? Right, I decided that it wasn't worth it to go in and try to take every one of those Saturday tests. You only had to pass a certain number of them. So I decided right up front, is this a test that I'm gonna want to study for or not? And if it was not, 
I didn't even touch it. I didn't even show up on Saturday morning. I slept in. Some people thought I was crazy, but it worked, right? I got smarter with how I was spending my time. I didn't do as well, but I still passed, which was what was important, right? In grad school, there's a saying, P is for PhD. You just have to pass. You have to get through. And they also are using a different grading scale than you guys. There's no A's and B's, right? There's pass, high pass, low pass, and fail. So it's basically four grades you can get. Right? But I was still miserable, and I was still thinking, maybe I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave after my second year. I'm going to leave with a master's degree. I'm going to go do something else. Um, it was that point where I realized what was keeping me moving, what was making me go back to this work that was just so exhausting and hard. And that's part of why I have this stack of books next to me, is what I found myself doing was I found myself going back to actually fiction texts, things like The Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. I, because these are long, epic journeys where people are struggling and sweating, sometimes dying, <laughs> um, these were stories that actually inspired me to keep going, to get up in the morning and to go in and to do the work that I had to do um, and, to, and to get smarter about it. Because these books, like Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Golden Compass, these, and later, this is a more recent find, The Martian, talk about doing science to save your life, highly recommended. And actually, the movie, in some ways, is better than the book. Um, these were stories that inspired me enough to keep going. Right. So a real turning point in graduate school came in my second year. Um, one of the hoops that we had to jump through was to give an oral presentation, right? to pick a topic out of the hat, to research that, and to give a presentation in front of all of the faculty and all of the students. And everyone in my class was terrified. In fact, this had such a reputation for being horrible and hard that there were students that were leaving the program just so they didn't have to do this. Now, wait a minute. This is just teaching. I can do this. Not only can I do this, but this is what I want to do. <laughs> right? So I got up there, and I was, I was so happy to finally be teaching after all of this work. And I got up there, and I was like, OK, we're going to learn about this. And I just taught. And I remember looking, and I remember one professor was just like, wow, like that. And it was like, because here I was, this person who'd, who'd failed her first test and was barely passing. And I did this great job. And not only that, I loved it. I really enjoyed giving that talk to everybody. <laughs> In fact, one professor actually marked me down a little because he said, too enthusiastic about topic. <laughs> My students will probably recognize that. <laughs> yeah. And then at the end of grad school, I really wanted to teach. But everyone was telling me, don't do that. Why make, what? Why make five figures when you can make six? <laughs> Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that, Karen? Actually, one friend of mine looked at me and said, well, wouldn't more money make you more happy? I said, well, I do think there's a certain baseline, you know, food, shelter, cats. Um, <laughs> but, but I would really prefer to be happy, and I think this is going to make me happy. And I said, well, you know, do you think I could get a job right now? This was in 2000, early 2008. I said, do you think I could get a job right now with my new PhD, like fresh off the, off the press? Could I get a job now? And I'm so grateful to my advisor, because he looked at me and he said, you know what? I think you should do the experiment. You're not going to know unless you apply. So I applied to several schools. I called here, called Dr. Butler, and said, hey, I'm, I'm going to be applying for schools. Do you have any advice to give me? And she said, yeah, why don't you apply here? We just wrote up the job description. We haven't even posted it yet. I'll send it to you. This is good, right? So. I applied to Chestnut Hill. I came here. I hurt my back horribly on the airplane getting my thing down. I was like doing a mock lecture, like hanging onto my back with an icy hot. And um, thank goodness they saw that I loved it. They knew that I was passionate about Chestnut Hill College. And they knew that I had, had the goods to be a teacher here. So it was my dream job. It still is. But I just wanted you to take away a couple of things from this talk. And the first one is. Does your life make sense? Does it make sense in your head? Because I think the world around us is always telling us that we are supposed to be something different. 
you know, that we're supposed to be one way when we're with our family, and we're supposed to be another way when we're with our friends, and we're supposed to be another way when we're at school, and another way on the weekends, and another way on a Sunday. As a scientist, that sort of thing in your head where you have all these different not coherent ideas, it's just going to tire you out, and it's going to make it so that nothing makes sense. Try to find a way for your life, your beliefs, what you're studying, your athletics, your extracurriculars, your faith. Try to find a way for it to all make sense. And the journey never ends. I caught myself in a really um, big, for me, um, moment a few years ago because I'd been thinking for years and years and years how badly I wanted to go to New Zealand, uh, partly because Lord of the Rings was filmed there. And so for many years, um, I was saving up money, saving up money, and then I was almost ready to go, and then, um, and then my car was totaled, and there went the money, and all this stuff happened. And then all of a sudden, I realized something. You know, I had a little money saved, and I realized, like, why am I not getting my ticket to New Zealand? Why? Because it's very strange for a single woman to just get on a plane and go to the other side of the world. Well, why is that strange? Well, it's strange because the world is telling you you're, you shouldn't do that. You know, the world was kind of subliminally telling me, you know, that's something that you should do with your friend or your boyfriend or your husband. And you just should wait. Wait until those things are in place before you follow this dream. So you know what? Nah. I'm going to do the experiment. I know it's going to be scary, but I'm going to do the experiment. So afterwards, if you're interested, this is my giant, epic, ah, New Zealand shutterfly because I went there for two and a half weeks, two summers ago, and I had the time of my life, and it was fantastic, right? You don't have to wait until things are as the world would have it for you. You can seize what you want to do right now. Make it your own story. Make it your own way. So I want to end with just repeating two things. One. Does it make sense? I say it all the time in class. Does this make sense? Ask yourself, does it make sense? And two, do the experiment. You're not going to know unless you try. And you're not going to really know unless you try hard. So thank you for having me here. It's been so wonderful to share a little bit. Um, I have no idea how long I took. I hope it was about the right time. And I think we're going to have some time for uh, questions and answers. So thank you. Everyone, I just wanted to introduce uh, myself. I'm Jackie Nunes, and I started in August here directing Campus Ministry. I just want to say thank you for taking the time. Your time is precious, and the act of you being here um, not only says something about what you want for your life, but what you deserve for your life. You deserve spaces like this that are insightful. And so I just wanted to say this started from a passion project. Marcel and Sam, a year ago, were passionate about bringing this program here. And I believe that we are spiritually empowered to bring what we're passionate about here for other people and also for ourselves, for that sense of ownership. So if there's something that you are passionate about right now in your life, and you're looking for an outlet or you're looking for support to make that more alive in your life, I encourage you to come see me. Um, I'm on the third floor of St. Joseph's Hall, and I'd like to also introduce Julia, who's a partner to mine, of mine in this work. So thank you again for being here. Hi, all. I'm Julia. Um, I know a lot of you, but some of you I don't. I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here. I think it really shows that there is energy and movement and joy, and I really thrive off of joy. Um, and I want to thank all of our student performers and Marcel and Sam and all of our student workers um, for making this evening great and beautiful. And if you want to be a part of it next semester, come our way and you can help plan and create another one of these nights. So I want to thank you all for being here and I hope you have a great rest of your night.